Anton Newcomb began his career as one of the most rock and roll front men ever. The creative and spiritual leader of the Brian Jonestown massacre, he didn't just tell the band what to do, he enforced it. So did you want to be a rock star? No, and I still don't. I really don't. I, that's the thing I don't like because there's the excess of rock stars. You think about the stories of like tour buses and groupies and, and young girls and all this stuff. And to me, like I'm more of a normal person in the sense that, um, you know, I never um, used music to break the ice with women. <laughs> you know, I'm more attracted to people on a, a physical level anyways, so it's like, and shy, so I'd have to basically go, oh my God, that's somebody that's really, I'm attracted to, I'd better ask him out on a date or something, or whatever, you know? Like really old school, kind of, I guess, you know what I mean? What, what about the money and the, the fame? I mean, was that appealing or? No, it, and, and I basically turned everything on its ear anyways. Um, continuously, which turned out to be so fortuitous because all of my peers, if you look at like the, let's say the class of 1990 and beyond, you know, um, what happened is they signed their publishing deals and went through the record thing and they were on the cover of Enemy and Sounds and Melody Maker and all this stuff. Well, there is no Sounds and Melody Maker anymore. Their publishing went to Spotify. They make no money off that. Their rent is no longer paid, so who knows if they've already split up with their wives and lost their place in Oxford or wherever that they lived, you know, wherever it was in Hackney or their flat, you know, and you just, and the record company owned their group name and they all broke up when that was dropped because the record companies don't exist anymore. So it was, for me, I knew it was kind of a big scam because I had studied the history of rock and roll and things like, for instance, um, Credence Clearwater Revival, you know, it's like, oh great, we're gonna get a rock and roll deal, you know, and never made anything. And here they have 20, 30 number one hits globally. These songs are in Apocalypse Now, and this Francis Ford Coppola, they never made one penny, and, and John Fogarty gets sued by Fantasy Records because he, as a solo artist, he sounds too much like himself. That was great for Fantasy because they did The English Patient and all, and, and all these movies, because that guy just wanted to, you know, use all that money to make films, but horrible if you're just an artist. When you watch Paul McCartney play bass, an old Beatles clip or something, there's nothing he does that shows you that you could be Paul McCartney because you can't. He's, they're phenomena. And Jimi Hendrix or any of these, these people, and it just goes on and on with these entertainers extraordinary. But when I saw the post-punk people, and that, that is a genuine folk movement, and the way that hip-hop was a genuine folk mu movement, of uh, music of the people, um, then I was like, these idiots, I can do this. I can do that. And it inspired me. Can, can I just ask, who do you mean by post-punk? Which are the people you mean? It was everybody from California stuff to the UK stuff. It was just everything that inspired me. My older sister was into NME, so it was just every single group that came out, you know, and she started with, you know, it morphed from her being into like whatever, Queen and all this stuff morphed into like every single group that came out after that when it really kicked off as morphing into New Wave and punk and everything that just all In the was. 1980s? You know? It was like the late 70s into the 80s, so I got to see her whole record collection. So for me it was perfectly natural from the commercial blurring to the, all the way to crass, you know, it was like blonde, it, it was no different to me. It was like, oh, it was all this stuff. The full spectrum, you know, whether it's sugary pop to this like anarchist music. And it's so funny because she ended up working for, just collecting crass records and worked for Ronald Reagan in the White House. You know, it's just like bananas to me. You do wonder whether you were born both in the wrong era and the wrong country. 
you know, you should have been born I'm in so Britain in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. Or, or See, that, you should have been a teenager. In, in, but in that, the was the that was the thing. That was the that was the thing. It to a certain extent. Um, yeah, yeah. It would have been great to to be around some of those philanthropists at that time that were making things happen. Whether it was the festivals, the movies, the swinging London thing. I mean that that's an era that's gone because I think that the real poverty these days is a poverty of ambition. People just don't know what to do with their money, you know. It's like, obviously, besides squirrel it away, is what they're not doing. Um, just the kind of bling is just ridiculous. I mean, you sound incredibly disciplined in your life now, um, which is, you know, so weird thinking back to how you were when you were a young man. I have a family, so like, my my family depends on me to to help take care of them, to, to, to play my role in the family. So I can't be like flying through the universe, you know, on some manic trip, right? Is that what you were doing? Well, progressively getting stranger, you know what I mean? But um, Because of drugs or? No, 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 I, see, I don't, I don't drink or, or do anything now, but um, it took me a while, see, um, if you must know, what happened in the 90s is I broke my arm really bad. I had a compound, double compound fracture. So it's like, and they kept me in the hospital for two weeks, kept me on morphine and Demerol, and that sort of hard for two weeks. So that sort of hard way wired my brain into knowing that I could do that because I had had, before that, I had had no drug taboos specifically. I wasn't really into like uppers or anything, but. I wasn't really afraid of anything, you know, as a young person. Um, but so eventually when somebody said, hey, do you want to do this? I was like, oh, no problem. And that started the ball rolling into addictions, you know, like with, with opiates. Uh, and so to get out of that was difficult. It's not difficult to stop. It's difficult to just stay stopped, basically, right? I segued into drinking. Um, because it's so painful and that led to me drinking like a lot but not like your mates on the high street like you see in any of the towns here right of people like outside the chippy right leaned over you know but I was drinking like a liter of vodka and then going out to bars and just doing 24 hours a day for just years you know living in hotels in Iceland and doing all kinds of stuff <laughs> collaborative are you? It depends on the situation. You know, some people are like, um, born with certain things, musical aptitude. See, I think of things orchestrally, so it all comes at once, which is very difficult for a democracy. Which, must, which makes it very hard to collaborate if people don't think on your... Depends. I'm a great guy on your team, wavelength. though. I'm a great guy on your team, though, but if you're on my team, you have to understand that because I might beat you every single position on the team, you know what I mean? It, I might already have you so covered. So you could never hire or find somebody as good as you, that, that, that's what It isn't saying. good, it's different because it's an individual taste thing, see? But um, it's, just compl it's just complex, it's like, I don't even think about these things. And a lot of times, I, I love having people, I can work by myself in my studio, meaning, meaning I can engineer and operate, but I love having somebody there because it's like a spark that it's faster than there's no contemplation. See what I'm saying? On, on every level. And it's, I just want somebody to see it happen, not for an ego thing, but just to like sort of, it's almost like a little kid thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I, I'm thinking about those scenes that we've seen from, from the 90s in Dick where, um, you know, you are, you're in charge, you're bossing the band. Mm. And, um, you know, did you just, did you see it as your, you know, this was your creative endeavor and everybody else would just do what 
Well, you have, talking, to, you have to under, a bit of a tyrant. So. You have to understand how you don't understand how, how the music business works because the first thing they do is they identify who the principal songwriter is and make a deal with you. The manager does that, everybody does it. Now the reason why this happens is because if a manager gets 20%, they identify the songwriter, they get 20% of 100% of the publishing. So the manager immediately cuts out the rest of the clowns. They would rather hire all the rest of the guys for 10 quid an hour than split, get 20% of one-fifth. See what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what happens immediately to everybody. That's why they sent Paul and, and John off to the corner, because the percentage. That's why the Rolling Stones, Andrew sent them off to a corner, because that percentage of just the writing, it's more money for the manager. It's more money for the publisher. See? It's cut the other guys out, because it's a bigger share if you get 20% of the two guys than 20% of the five guys. What do you like on stage now, by comparison to how you were? I'm like watching Neil Young in Buffalo Springfield and less like watching, uh, Pete Doherty throw a guitar into the audience or some weirdness. It's, it's, it's okay to uh, grow old naturally, I think older, grow sideways, something, I don't know. You know what I mean? I think it's good, actually. I'm enjoying it. I wouldn't want to be a teenager, you know?